conflict and insurgency, it takes me back to the time when we were studying in Burma with my friends. We were in, we were in classes and we started hearing gunshots, bombs being dropped all around us. Je sais qu'il était à Goragadi pour venir à Douli parce que ce sont des hommes armés qui sont venus. Ils ont tué les gens, ils ont brûlé le commissariat, ils ont chassé les élèves et les anciens. Ходить сильно обстрелы, бывает ощущение, что вот если ты сейчас уйдешь из дома, есть вероятность, что не каждый туда обратно вернется. Вот, и как раз когда начали расстрелы, Военные все равно у нас есть, все равно оружие в магазинах, вечером ходят везде, мне страшно лично. Наши учителя, они делали для нас вот очень комфортную и действительно безопасную атмосферу, даже когда начинался обстрел, то есть мы там сидели на том же полу, в том же коридоре, как-то был всегда учитель, который разрядит эту обстановку, и ты уже не слишком сильно задумывалась о том, что происходит за, за твоими же окнами. Образование очень важно для детей и неотъемлемая часть, получается, социального человека. Очень, конечно же, важно соблюдать это и в местах линии разграничения. Я говорю, что это эмоционально изучать и очень важно для всех, чтобы создать мир лучше, в котором нет войны, violencia, расизм и чтобы быть в мире с гармонией. Je souhaite que la paix revienne au Burkina Faso et les hommes et tous les enfants s'inscrivent à l'école. Je vais vous demander de revenir à l'école et à la vie de tous les gens et les enfants. Les enfants ne sont pas innovés à ce qu'il y a eu un conflit. Я думаю, что декларация сможет что-либо изменить, но не быстро. Наверное, все зависит от того, в чьих руках она будет находиться.
Ladies and gentlemen, delegates, on behalf of the organizers of this event, the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, Save the Children, and the Education in Emergencies Working Group in Nigeria, it is an honor to welcome you to this very first event of the Fourth International Conference on the Safe Schools Declaration. I especially welcome our dignified guests, including His Excellency Minister of State for Education for the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Chukwen Mecca, Nwajibu, and all other dignitaries. I also welcome our panelists, the African Union Commissioner of Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Ambassador Bankoli Arioye. Education Cannot Wait Director, Ms. Yasmin Sharif, and the CEO of Save the Children International, Ms. Inga Ashing. And I welcome our audience here in Abuja and online around the world. My name is Zayma Neff, and I am co-chair of the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack and the director of the Children's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. We open the conference with the civil society session because civil society from the start has been crucial in driving the Safe Schools Declaration agenda forward. You, my fellow members of civil society, have been on the front lines fighting for children's education. You have seen schools reduced to rubble, converted to military bases, your own education workers threatened, kidnapped, and killed. But you have not stopped because you have believed in the fundamental, life-saving right to education. And you have not merely witnessed attacks, you have demanded change. Those who hold the power must do better. You have demanded that decision makers fulfill their obligation to ensure that education is safe, even in armed conflict. And since its launch in 2015, the Safe Schools Declaration provides a way. Because safe education during war is not just an aspiration, it is a tangible goal that we know how to address. We have been working on this for more than a decade and change is happening. Today we open the conference rightly focusing on those who are most affected, students and teachers. Malala Yousafzai has said, when the whole world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. Today we have invited brave and powerful voices from around the world, from Nigeria, Colombia, and Syria. Their voices must set the scene for the next three days. And they will pose questions that will lead us to our panelists. Now, this will be where your questions come in, and I encourage you all to participate actively, ask your toughest questions, and for those of you online, you can even start posting now through the Q&A box. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Pasi Amani. Mr. Amani co-leads the Education and Emergencies Working Group in Nigeria, and he's based in Ni Maiduguri in Northeast Nigeria. Mr. Amani has worked for and led different INGOs and UN agencies over the last 15 years. Originally from Congo, where he began his career, he has also worked in Mali, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, and Nigeria. Mr. Amani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Zama. Thank you, Zama. Uh, Your Excellencies, let me align to uh, on existing protocols. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Education in Emergency Working Group Nigeria, I warmly welcome all of you on the fourth international conference on safe school, which Nigeria has the honor to co-host. We are gathered all year because all of us, we believe in power of education. Where I work in Northeast, region of Nigeria, I mean, Yobe, Borno, and Adamawa, where school is more than just a place to learn. School is something like a protection tool of the community. Schools are protective space, place to escape the danger of insecurity and hardship of the environment and socio-economic realities. But despite their incredible values, schools have under gone under persistent attack in evil time in the recent years. 
A consultative estimated over than 1,000 students and learners have been updated from school in Nigeria since December 2020. Today, parents are very, very apprehensive and avoid to send their children to school because they are not sure they will return alive at the end of the day. The fact of this is not just an emergency reality in Nigeria alone, but across Africa and beyond across the world, this has become a grave concern. It's a global problem requiring global and urgent action. The civil society must itself have done enough to support the work with the government to prevent this attack against education. As the government have put also a lot of efforts in that framework on prevention, protection, and mitigation against attack to guarantee fundamental human rights of education to all. Permit me to share with you some achievements in Nigeria from education coalition between the government, civil society, and development actor under the umbrella of EIU Working Group, Education Emergency Working Group. Nigeria was one of the first group of 37 countries to endorse the Safe School Declaration in 2015. Following the Emergent Strength and Coalition of Engagement Platform, the President, Muhammad Buhari, President, Commander-in-Chief of Federal Republic of Nigeria, signed the instrument to ratify the SST in December 2019. This ratified, and it's, it has been a strong signal to the country in terms of commitment and uphold implementing principles of Safe School Declaration. The strong commitment of government paved for the coalition with the government leadership to develop the first plan of action in 2018 that led tremendous achievement on the implementation of SST. Review the legal and policy framework on protection of education from attack with full participation of GCPA, now it turns. Appointed SST desk officer in the, in the Federal Ministry of Education and established Interministry Committee, IMC, to coordinate SST implementation. Secure the involvement and participation of Nigeria Armed Forces and other security agencies in promoting and implementation of SSD principles in the in an agenda in Nigeria. Develop the national policy of safety, security, and violence-free schools policy with its implementation guidelines. Develop the national minimum standard of safe school in Nigeria. Develop participant manual and facilitator guidelines for mainstreaming the SSD into security agencies and human rights organization, which launched on 14th October 2021 by Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Defense. Beyond all these achievements, big ones, development partners have been very active and creative among them. We can mention UNICEF that has built institutional capacity, promoting and strengthening safe school via development of conflict sensitive school disaster plan and regular practice of evacuation drill in the northeast in the northwest Nigeria. In the northeast Nigeria, a total of 70, 750 schools in Borno state possess this, their own plans and regular updates in terms of emergency structures. International NGOs such as Save the Children, Plan International, Street Child, APAD, AHA have been very, very active and pioneer in SSD, supporting FME and other government structure initiatives. And national organization, let's mention it, we have national organization in Nigeria, such as ROI, Go Prime, Katai, that are leading the way to ensure that safe school remain very implemented in Nigeria. While much has been achieved, there is still much work to be done in Nigeria and other parts of the world. In case we can mention, if much is that to left to be done, not quickly, the battle to protect schools and terminate attack against education. The upscale of support from political leaders, donors, and international community to secure schools, to ensure that all communities and partners are engaged in the process of securing schools are an urgent imperative. Key intervention at school and community level can be conducted through long-term emergencies, sensitive budgeting and planning, 
substantial increasing of public finance and of, of education to promote sustained education continuity is very critical. We believe that communities, leaders, SBMCs members, religion group, have the key role to play in order to make learning space safe and secure. This should drive the accountability agenda of duty bearers and K level drawing attention to school for increasing protection and learn, learners, especially for girls and other children with special needs. This accountability strategy should be prioritized and community duly empowered. We need to empower community by establishing strength and early warning system, effective monitoring and reporting mechanisms, and strong collaboration between the community and security agencies in tackling the menace, menace to, of attack on school. We appeal to all endorsing nations on implementing the SST guidelines and ensure education continuity during armed conflict and inclusive quality education providing at all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, by joining us together today, you have already expressed your commitment to education. The different governments represented here today, among all and with all technical financial partners, all of us have committed to support education. Let us unite to ensure that education is safe and inclusive for all children in the world. Attending school should no longer be a risk, but rather a safe, normal, and essential daily routine for every child of school age in all communities around the globe. Education has been vulnerable and threatened for too long. Enough is enough. This evident threat to humanity must not be allowed to become a norm. This fourth conference on safe school is a reminder and a clarion call that only in togetherness can heal and restore the sanctity of education. Ladies and gentlemen, let us each bring a piece of wood to restoration fire to set that it burn bright and let up the globe education village lighter. Let us write history together in Abuja. Let us write history today. The protection of education from attacks is a dangerous threat at pressing issue at all level and in all spheres of human endeavor. The battle must not be lost. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amani, and thank you so much to the Education in Emergencies Working Group of Nigeria. Now I will give the floor to Ms. Gayatri Butler, the Director of Advocates Program of the Malala Fund. Over to you, um, Mrs. Butler, who is speaking to us. Um, she's unable to join live, but she has shared a recorded message with us. So over to her. Good afternoon, everybody. Your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, respected colleagues, thank you to the hosts, the Education and Emergencies Working Group and Save the Children for inviting me to speak today and to all the partners involved in organizing this important conference. My name is Gayathri Butler. I'm the director of our Education Advocates programs at Malala Fund, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak to you all today. At Malala Fund, we recognize and believe in the power of local leaders to shape change. We're an organization dedicated to supporting education advocates, activists, and girls around the world to ensure that governments guarantee the right to 12 years of free, safe, and quality education for every child. Malala Fund knows that girls are the experts in their own experiences and that their advocacy can enhance the impact and sustainability of change. Through this work, we know that the need for this global conference has never been more urgent. Recent data gives us part of that picture. From the 2020 Attack on Education report that I'm sure many of you have seen, we know that at least 93 countries, almost half the countries in the world, have been affected by attacks on education between 2015 and 19, 
and that two-thirds of those attacks reported were directly on schools. We also know from this report that girls' and women's experiences with these attacks are very different to boys and men. The report shows us that across half the countries profiled, women and girls were directly targeted or more exposed to attacks because of their gender, often in the form of sexual violence or violent repression of their education. The current crisis in Afghanistan provides us with a stark reminder of this fact, as doors to girls' secondary schools remain closed for the 38th day in a row since the Taliban's de facto ban began. But for me, the best way to understand the urgency of this work is when I hear from girls themselves. On International Day of the Girl in Nigeria this year, Malala Fund and local partners organised a conference for girls and young women from across the country to come together to share their experiences of insecurity in schools and to tell leaders how can they better protect girls' rights to learn. It was at this conference that we heard from a secondary school girl student who told us about her own experience studying for exams with the sounds of bullets passing over her head. She said, the minute you hear that, you just knew that's when you had to go down. It became like a normal thing. Everybody just had to go under the table whilst the teachers reassured you, don't worry, it will soon be over and then we can get back to revising. She went on to describe how on one occasion she watched her teacher being stabbed as he shepherded them out of the classroom towards safety during a crisis. She remembered, we just ran. At that point, we didn't care where to, we just ran. This young woman's story wasn't the most dramatic story of the conference, but that one phrase she used, it became like a normal thing, was what stuck with me the most. I see this as the real call to action for all of us today. Because for too many children around the world, the sound of bullets flying overhead has become normal. Terror and violence on their way to school has become normal. Exposure to sexual violence for girls and young women has become normal. We need to create a new normal. The good news is that for many countries, the journey towards building a world where children can safely learn and lead has already started. 112 states have already endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration and are on that path to implementation. Through Malala Fund, I've been able to see how this commitment to the Safe Schools Declaration has brought progress here in Nigeria through our education champions like Benjamin John from the Restoration of Hope Initiative, who's been working with the Education in Emergencies Working Group to implement the Safe School Declaration in two states here in Borno and Adamawa. Through this work, we've not only been able to see state and federal level progress, but also how the Declaration has opened up the conversation about the challenge of safety in schools beyond contexts of conflict. Communities are now discussing gender-based violence as well as protecting girls from natural and everyday hazards which contribute to insecurity and violence. I want to congratulate everyone involved in this work in Nigeria and also those collaborations in other signatory countries who are showing the same commitment. But in the spirit of this year's conference theme, from commitment to practice, I want to take this opportunity to encourage you all to go further. Promises are not enough. Around the world, girls are still choosing between safety and school. They are calling on leaders like you to translate your commitments into coordinated action and defend their right to learn. At the International Day of the Girl Conference in Nigeria I mentioned, that coalition of girls and young women developed their own charter for change, identifying six ways the government of Nigeria can improve its implementation of the Safe Schools Declaration. This included asking leaders to invest in making school premises safe for girls so they can remain in school in unharmed. To ensure that all girls are safe while going to school, at school and returning home from school. And to implement the Safe School Declaration through a gender responsive approach, including allocating resources to address sexual and gender-based violence peculiar to girls. Malala Fund asks that all governments in attendance today recognise the urgency of this crisis and commit to signing the Safe Schools Declaration and ensure its implementation.
To those that have endorsed the declaration and started the journey, we ask that you, governments, civil society and civil society partners, use this conference to accelerate the action and ensure your efforts centre the opinions and experiences of, pe of the people most affected by insecurity and violence, including girls. At Malala Fund, we recommend to working with, uh, we recommit to working with you all to protect education from attack. Dodging bullets while reading school books shouldn't be a normal thing. Searching for safety while revising for exams shouldn't be a normal thing. Building a new normal, one where every child can safely learn and lead, starts with each one of us here today. Around the world, girls are calling on us to defend their right to education. Let's make sure they are not alone. Thank you. Thanks so much to Ms. Butler for these inspirational words. And for me, what particularly resonated was the urgency in her call to action. Ms. Butler from the Malala Fund makes an extremely important point, and that is the fact that girls are often too overlooked when we look at what happens to violence in schools. I'll actually never forget sitting in um, Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya talking to children who had escaped from Somalia. And there was a young woman named Amina who described to me the last day she went to school. She said that armed fighters burst into her classroom and said, I'll take this girl and this girl and this girl. And those girls were never heard from again. And that was the last day that Amina went to school. The Global Coalition has found that throughout the world, what happens to girls and boys is not always the same. And particularly from the perspective of civil society, it's crucial to take that into account from the beginning of how to prevent attacks from occurring, um, but reparation and justice for victims. Thank you very much, because now it's really time to turn to the people who speak in the voice of why we are here today, three very powerful and brave individuals from Nigeria, Colombia, and Syria. We will start first with Ms. Joy Bishada. Joy is from Chibok, Nigeria, and she is the survivor of a horrific Boko Haram kidnapping in Chibok in 2014. But Joy has inspired countless people with her story. And she has recently graduated from college with a bachelor's degree in social work, which has been described not only as an important milestone for Joy, but a triumph over terror. Ms. Bashara, the floor is yours. So I just so wanted to just take us to back, take to, back to, to what happened that, that night that before I can give more, more information. information. So, so I was asleep, I was asleep that, night, that night and my friend my woke, friend me, woke up, me up and she said to she listen. Said, and when I was listening, listen, the ground was shaking and there were gunshots outside of the gate of our school. And all of us woke up, and the first thing I remembered us doing is to, um, we were trying to figure out to make sure our family are doing well inside town. And we got it around and decided to pray for them to get to safety, which we did. And after we finished praying, we were deciding on what to do. Then a man came in dressed in a soldier uniform. And he said he's here to help us and keep us safe from what is going on outside. And we believed him because we used to have soldiers who do come in and make sure we are safe before they go out. So, um, but then when he asked to get in line and we were all sitting in a circle and then more of them started to come in through the walls, through the door and they just everywhere. And that was when we realized they were not soldiers, that they were the Boko Haram group. But it was too late because we were all sitting down in the circle, there is no way to run. Um, they asked a few questions, and we had no answers to their questions, which actually got kind of angered them the more. And um, then they decided to take us all to the main gate where they put us there to sit in a circle. And we were sitting there, and they were taking out foods from the food store and loading it into the trucks. And then, they decided to ask us to follow a direction that is leading into the bushes and far away from North town. And that was when I realized, oh, we're not going home. I thought that when they were afraid, they would think to let us go. They set the school ablaze. They burned everything before we left. 
and then they brought some trucks, and we had choice. They gave us two choices, to either die or get into the trucks that they brought. And of course, none of us wanted to die. So all of us just helped each other to climb a small-sized car in order to get into the trucks. All of us loaded up into the trucks, and they started driving away. And that, in that moment, they realized that I'm driving far away from home, and I might not be able to see my family or loved ones ever again. And this might be it. But for some reason, one of their cars couldn't move, so um, they decided to go back and help. And that was the chance we had in order to jump out. So I jumped out, ran through throughout the night. In the morning, we were still running in the morning, and there was a man, a farmer, going to the farm. So we asked him for a ride, and he took us back to Chile. So I have some pointers on what this, um, on the impact of attack that, uh, that, that attacks have on school and education. Education is very important, and every child has the right to study their dreams in, in a safe school. Without education, we won't have intel intelligent leaders such as presidents, governors, congressmen, chairmen, officers, and good decision makers. Education is important, and every student should be able to study their dreams in a safe school and not to be stopped. My message to the leaders: the government needs to make more needs to be more responsible in protecting schools during conflicts because governments are the powerful people of the nations, and if they can't protect their subjects, then who will? Um, or can the government be in power without its people? The people are to be protected by, the, by their government, because with their, without the people, there will be no government, and without both, there will be no nation. I plead with every nation to please protect its people, and more especially students who are in school studying their future careers. I hope and pray that no student will go through what I went through because of an unprotected school. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Thank you so much, Ms. Vishana. I'll now give the floor to Daisy Aparicio. Daisy is a student representative and vice president of the National Peace Council of Colombia. She's a feminist, an anti-militarist, and a founder of the Association of Secondary School Students, Andes Colombia. Daisy, over to you. While we wait for the next speaker, I just want to respond to a point that Joy made, which is her plea to the delegates attending this conference. And I think that's what the Safe Schools Declaration is really about. It's governments listening to and responding to the plea of children trying to go to school, to the plea of teachers who are trying to teach in order that they can actually do something real. And that's what the Safe Schools Declaration has done. Now we'll go directly to our next Syrian child rights activist, Mr. Ahmed Turki Arafat. After the conflict started in Syria, he co-founded an initiative called Hiras in order to repair the damage to the education sector caused by the war. And in 2015, Ahmed joined Huras' network, a Syrian child protection network, and is now Huras' manager for Northeast Syria. Mr. Arafat, the floor is yours. As uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to inform you that I'm from Syria and, and when the uh, Russian government invaded the Syria, we were not happy and a lot of things took over and schools being shut down. And when I was a small, actually many people at this school it was like very, very unfortunate because the school being distracted and the children were not going to school. And it, is, it was very, very painful because 
we encountered and witnessed this scenario. And we are trying to build the future of the children so as to avoid a such of uh, evasion. And I am very glad uh, to see that this a kind of uh, conference is taking place because I know there will be a kind of, uh, you understand, things that will bring solutions to the, I mean, uh, in, I mean, self schools declaration and uh, Ibrahim or Umar and his teacher and their teacher, they were all also taken away and they were like sitting in the uh, metropolis and being attacked and they were like afraid. There was a kind of a panic. How do we explain to the parents of these children? What, how do we explain to the family of their teacher that being killed just because of uh, schooling? And in the whole, I mean, countries, schools should be considered as where can build the future. Therefore, I am calling on everybody to look what is taking place in, in Syria because in Syria is taking different dimension actually in uh, and I call on your intention to look at what goes on in Syria in terms of learning in Syria there is no there is nothing like conducive environment for learning because airplanes are attacking and uh, many attack disturbs learning in Syria therefore how can we have a conducive learning how the children could get uh, uh, conducive learning and uh, to avoid learning or to attack learning is just that a soldier without a weapon without a soldier without a kind of a gun and one of the Fam Shekhun, there is one school that an incident occurred. And, and this invasion affects this school also. And the masses or the children in that school actually witnessed a lot of pain and a lot of incidences that occurred and uh, the staff expelled the some of the staff being expelled why so all these issues should be looked into and we are trying to train the children in other to have enhanced learning and in other to have a very good future and in other to build the future of uh, tomorrow and uh, we all, uh, one of 150 schools. Uh, so, and if we need to, uh, we, these schools, these schools, these schools, we could be able to make an impact, we understand, when we enhance good learning. But when we are like uh, having a kind of attacks from the, you know, airplanes, how can we concentrate on learn or on education? So this invasion, uh, to in fact, to be sincere with you, it brought a setback. It brought a lot of failure in the uh, in Syria in terms of education. And my 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 message to you is. We should try and make sure that the schools are going successfully and the school should be, uh, eyes should be put and things will be going perfectly good in order to have good learning and enhanced learning and also to protect children from any harmful action. And uh, uh, thirdly, we should try and avoid ourselves from, you understand, trying to attack the children or to protect the children from the good learning. 
and we should try to avoid any circumstance that will protect children from learning. And I thank you. Paola is just 14 years old, but she loves helping people, painting, and spending time with family and friends. But she is also dedicated to preventing school students and teachers from being the target of violent attacks. Paola says that she likes to talk about these issues since she has lived them herself, and that truth is a very ugly one. Thank you for joining us, Paola. Good afternoon, I'm from Colombia. I have, I'm 14 years old. I suffered from violence that tormented us, myself and my friends. Some time ago, we were in school. We were in our different classes. But suddenly, we heard about a big noise. We were afraid. One of my friends were very shocked and others started weeping. Some time later, the gunshot was com were coming closer. We close the windows and the doors and we block it with uh, our table. We also hid ourselves under the table. After everything, there were bullets in our school where we played in school and very closer to us. And one of the bombs fell and broke a window. One of my friends uh, was, was very afraid and he couldn't overcome the trauma and another one couldn't come back to the school and they didn't come back to study. Sometime after I knew save the children and we like it. We want to get safe schools. We were, were wondering how they did everything. Another opportunity that we got is what we, we put in the manifesto that we children, we want to have safe schools. The truth is that what we put in this manifesto, we want to avoid this type of violence. We want to find a solution. What is also interesting, we, want, we put our point of views with children, young people, adolescents, we, we were suffering of war. I want to tell you another aspect that I like in the manifesto. We, we are preparing ourselves. We want you to help us. We want the school to be very safe. And this, in, in this manifesto, we put the problems that are affecting the children of the world. One of the problems is is the enrollment of children in armed group in my village in some time ago armed groups were recruiting children and they forced them to carry weapons some are only 15 years old or 16 years old but because of God Everything is, 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 is finding solution. Everything is okay. We like the title of the manifesto that we are that's saying that we don't want to be afraid. This, I like the title because, because it is a, a bearing message that children, we don't want to suffer anymore because we want to dream of this school that we are desiring. See, if we don't have peace uh, in school, we, have to, we, 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 we want to have peace in school. We want to have this magic school that all the children are dreaming with our friends and our teachers. We want to get education and to grow up and, and be responsible in life. I want to finish uh, as the manifesto is saying something very good. The countries that have not signed, like my, my own country, Colombia, I'm urging them to sign this declaration. We don't want to have wars anymore. 
in schools we have we want to have peace we want that magic school that we are dreaming about and countries that have signed i want to express my gratitude for your the way you engage yourself we, we, we thank you and we children we thank you very much thank you so much paula and as Ms. Butler spoke about the normalization of violence in schools, I think Paula gives us a powerful counterbalance to a 14-year-old girl and her reference to the Children's Manifest saying, no, we expect more from our leaders. We expect to have schools that are safe. Now we're joined back on the line by Daisy Aparicio, also from Colombia. Good afternoon, all. It is a pleasure for me to be here in this uh, fourth international conference on the Safe Schools Declaration. In Colombia, unfortunately, the situation is changing a lot. A few years ago, we did think that um, thanks to the peace agreement that the government signed with the armed groups, we could have peace in the country. Unfortunately, the situation is getting worse today. And because the situation is getting worse, we have uh, attacks against schools. We do have a situation where uh, some schools are occupied by armed groups and because of that we have kids that cannot go to school. From 1990 to 2020 in Colombia we had more than 400 attacks against schools and today these attacks are still continuing because we have more and more uh, armed groups. This is a situation that uh, the Colombian government could not fight and could not stop. This was affecting and still affecting the young people. We do have a movement of youth uh, called Enarbola and we have a movement uh, and a campaign called No More Wars Against the Youth. We would like to denounce through this campaign the attacks uh, that are killing some children because those children were recruited by armed groups. And also we would like to denounce the fact that the Colombian government is calling those children war machines in order to give some sort of legitimacy to these attacks that they are doing against those kids and unfortunately since the pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic we do have hundreds of children that cannot go to school sometimes for uh, financial uh, economical reasons and because of that there are a lot of kids that are staying at home and they are being recruited by the armed groups and still in the pandemics Today, we have more and more conflicts. That is so a situation that led to the fact that we have more IDPs today in the country. The rate of IDPs in the country increased by 100%, which affected the educational life of a lot of children around the country, especially in rural areas. Beyond that, and after, uh, we also have a new phenomenon, which is the lack of resources in order to implement the peace agreement. And in this peace agreement, we have the National Plan of Education. If we had the resources, we would have implemented it and we would have better um, uh, conditions and the children can go to school. They would not be targeted by the armed groups. And also, this uh, would allow us to reduce the gap between the rural and the urban areas. Apart from that, we have the fact that this conflict is affecting the children because the, the children are being recruited by the armed groups, like I said, and some of the children are victims of uh, sexual violence, especially the young the, uh, girls. So talking about the security in schools, it's also to talk about this aspect, the fact that the girls are being affected. So we need to stop uh, patriarchy. We need to actually stop and fight uh, the um, machism in our country. Another message I would like to pass in this international conference is that all the countries, the international community basically, need to put pressure on the government of Colombia for them to sign the peace agreement so that at the end of the day, we can actually have more investment in education, better investment in education and Thanks to that, we can reduce the gap between the young people, the young girls, the young boys, and give education to the children. Education is a right. We 
need to also make sure that the government of Colombia stops calling these children war machines. They need to consider these children as members of society. They have a right. They can participate. They can build the society. And they are part of democracy, basically. And they need to think about our safety as well, because this is something really important. We do also have the issue of immigration, because we see that everywhere we need to break all the form of discrimination and that is through actions that we can come uh, and also campaigns we need to make sure that violence is not in schools and that uh, violence is kicked out of society and we do hope that we will not have a society of violence so we need to be involved as young people and because of that we have this campaign this campaign that is called no more wars that is affecting um, our security and also we need to fight for more um, social justice thank you very much thank you so much daisy and thank you joy and paula and ahmed you have shown tremendous courage in telling your stories and advocating for your rights and the rights of your fellow students your words must stay with us for the remainder of the conference to keep reminding us of why we are here we have heard from young people around the world because attacks on education is not just a problem of a single country. It persists in the majority of armed conflicts everywhere. And that's why this kind of global response is so important. So my plea and my thank you is to states that are fortunately in peace who have heard the voices of children like these who are suffering armed conflict who have said, please join the global community of states. Please endorse the Safe Schools Declaration and give us the kind of global response that is required. Paula, you ask a question that was particularly pertinent to the next panel. So with this, I will invite Ambassador Adoye to join me here on the stage. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. I have with me here the African Union's Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Ambassador Benkole Adeoye, a true champion and trailblazer for the Safe Schools Declaration over the African continent. The ambassador is a pan-African career diplomat with over three and a half decades of experience. I'm so very pleased to have you with us. And I believe in a moment we'll be joined on the screens behind us, the Director of Education Cannot Wait, Ms. Yasmin Sharif, who is also a champion for children's rights to education in emergencies with over 30 years of experience from UNDP, OCHA, UNHCR, and other international organizations. We also have the CEO of Save the Children International, Ms. Inga Ashing. Ms. Ashing has been associated with Save the Children for more than 25 years, first serving as a youth advocate and later on the boards of Save the Children Sweden and Save the Children International. So thank you all for joining us today. Let's start with Paola's question. How do you all identify the main problems that affect children in order to appropriately respond in conflict-affected areas? Can you repeat the question, please? Um, it's, Paola, it's Paola's question who um, asks how, um, when we consider the main problems that affect children in conflicted, affected areas, how, for example, does the African Union decide how to respond? What's in most important to do? No, thank you very much. Let me first of all give you the personal experience I had in 2017, July. I was privileged, I believe, to have met some of the Chibo girls who regained their freedom. And that changed my career, my response to children affected by armed conflict. I returned to Addis Ababa. Then I was Nigeria's ambassador and permanent representative to the African Union and to Ethiopia. And I decided that we were not doing enough. I believe every conflict, every war is against children. It's not just belligerence. It's against education. Having seen children 
holding children as some of the cheaper girls who regained freedom. And there, I started pushing personally for what we call the group of friends that brought players, diplomatic leaders, policy makers, decision makers together from member states, from partners, the civil society, the academia. And I believe we can respond collectively. This is a battle that we must fight together. And I think that response eventually led to us establishing today in the African Union what we call the African Platform on Children Affected by Armed Conflict. Having just been re elected Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, after the nomination of, by His Excellency, President Muhammad Buhari, it was good to now champion this cause. And the most important thing is that we must respond universally. I think it is not, Safe Schools Declaration is not one response that we have to do in piecemeal. It must be collective, it must be in-depth, and it must be universal. So currently, the African Union, member states, organs of the African Union, indeed the most strategic organ, the Peace and Security Council of the African Union, are all seized with this matter. But we have to do it more. 31 countries of our 55 member states have currently endorsed the SSD. We have to go beyond that and turn this conference, in my view, into an international movement and a movement that will lead to the universalization of the Safe School Declaration, to make it universally important for children to be secured when they are in schools. Thank you so much for those remarks, Ambassador, and I especially appreciate the challenge that you pose to states that have not yet joined the declaration to use this conference as an opportunity to learn about what has been done and to join that global community. So thank you for stressing that point as well. Uh, perhaps now we can turn to the impact of the Safe Schools Declaration. And Ambassador, can you share with us, in your opinion, how is the Safe Schools Declaration making a difference? Um, let's talk specifically about the implementation of the Safe Schools Declaration. And, and you have so much experience in a country-specific content text, but also moving to the African Union, which has recently taken the very important step of banning African Union peacekeepers from using schools. Can you talk more about the impact of the declaration so far, how it's making a difference, and what you would like to see in the future? We, we have to be forthright. The impact needs to be more continent-wide, and one of the efforts we are making is to propagate the new AU doctrine on peace support operations in the specific countries, context of Somalia, in the Sahel, in the Lake Chad Basin, in Central African Republic, and recently in Mozambique. And what we are using is to use peace education as a factor to promote the awareness, not only among policymakers, but boots on the ground, the African Union peace support operators that we have in these countries, in the country-specific regions, and using the regular training to make the difference. I believe with consistency and the support of the leaders of our member states, 55 of them together, and those that have signed the SSD, we can make that difference. And it is necessary for us to use the doctrine as a sounding board to make the difference that we want to see and the impact in that respect. We have to do that in all our peace support operations. And for us in the African Union, we are, part we are, we are in partnership with the United Nations and all leading intergovernmental bodies to make this change happen, centered on peace education and making sure that our own policies in-house will also be uh, upgraded and reviewed regularly through the PCLD, what is called the Post-Conflict Reconstruction and Development Framework. 
Thank you so much, and for really pointing to very practical, concrete, helpful steps that will make a, li a difference in the lives of children. Now let's go back to Ms. Sharif for your comments on the impact and the importance of the Safe Schools Declaration. Okay, thank you so very much, and I hope that you can hear me. Uh, I'm very sorry that my sound went off uh, earlier. I'm actually calling in from Afghanistan, from Kabul, where I'm traveling right now, and, and where the Safe School Declaration feels very real and the need for it. Uh, but before going into to, to discuss um, the, how we can use the Safe School Declaration and how it makes a difference, I'd like to thank Nigeria for hosting this year's uh, event. In Nigeria, it's been interesting to listen to, to joy and sad also, uh, and very painful uh, for what you had to go through with Boko Haram. But also in other countries where education cannot wait, and make big investments, trying to focus on protection and working closely in support of the Safe Schools Declaration, such as Colombia Syr and Syria. So thanks to Paula and Daisy and Ahmed as well. Um, what difference? Well, what is important here is that the Safe Schools Declaration um, reminds governments and signatories to the actions that have to be taken, uh, both in the forms of legal protection and physical protection, um, and offers very concrete guidance and, and, and measures on, on the behavior of armed forces and armed groups and non-state actors. And, and I think this is, this is where we see the value in it um, and are very supportive of the global coalition to protect the education from attack. Um, what is important in a situation like this is to have very robust data very robust data to understand what's going on, but it doesn't stop there. And, but to use that data to provide assistance to the victims um, and also to ensure that there's compliance and investigate um, and, and prosecute those who commit breaches uh, or violations. And on the ground for practitioners who implement education support and, and investments, to ensure that they are conflict sensitive. Education cannot wait work by many different UN agencies like UNICEF, UNHR, WFP, UNESCO, and big groups of civil society, uh, Save the Children, Plan International, Norwegian Refugee Council, and numerous um, national civil society organization, organizations, and, and, and to empower them to actually put in place protection mechanisms so that, so that we um, can ensure that uh, the funding investments have been made and not only provide access to an education, but to can go to school safely um, through protection mechanisms such as transport, walls around schools and various uh, monitoring mechanisms. For instance, in Syria, in Education Cannot Wait's investments, um, in our multi-year resilience programs, which is implemented by numerous partners together in collaborative, uh, collaborative approach. We have established um, a, 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 a system of procedures to operational alerts uh, across the education sector that allows actors to respond within 12 hours of an attack. And in Palestine, over 5,000 um, children uh, across 22 schools have benefited from the provision of um, disaster um, risk the, um, the reduction mechanism uh, and safety equipment. And we have also trained um, um, staff of these schools to operate certain safety systems. So there is, there is the, the practical protection on the ground that the Safe School Declaration um, in many ways um, remind and encourage and guide um, practitioners, but also the host governments and hopefully um, um, non-state actors, because that data, that robust data that is produced will one day also be used to hold them accountable. There will be accountability and there will be justice and the advocacy that we, there is zero tolerance in attacking innocent children and, and adolescents who go to school to learn and be productive uh, in the midst of a conflict. And I do agree with the ambassador, all armed conflicts 
are, are marked by severe violations and often schools are being used to attack children, their teachers, uh, and um, uh, or are being attacked. Um, so um, uh, we need to keep that their voice heard and the Safe School Declaration serves that purpose. So for every signatory we see, we make a step forward. Thank you so much for those excellent points. And points I especially and I your, appreciate your bringing in the need for accountability as just a critical way to provide justice for victims, but also to prevent future attacks. Now let's turn to Ms. Ocheng from her perspective. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I want to start by thanking the Education and Emergency Working Group in Nigeria for hosting this important uh, event today. And it's great that uh, we're all here because I think this is, uh, we all agree that this is one of the most uh, pressing and critical uh, situations we are facing in the world today where education that is so key uh, for children uh, is being uh, attacked uh, and schools um, being part of, of conflict uh, where it should be safe. Uh, and um, as Save the Children, we see every day uh, how children are affected by attacks on education. And attacks on education and military use of schools put students and teachers in danger, as we've heard uh, previously today. It reduces access to education and exposes children to risk of death, injury, recruitment, and sexual exploitation and abuse. And there's also a risk when it comes to a lot of other areas uh, for children, such as being more vulnerable to, to child labor, being more vulnerable to early child marriage, etc. But we also see uh, the transformational impact that the Safe School Declaration is having for children, families, teachers, and local communities. Because we do know that when attacks on schools cease, and governments or armed groups stop using schools and learning institutions for military purposes. Children can attend school again and then they can be safe and they can learn. It is critical to make sure that the declaration is translating into action and that requires engagement from governments, military and non-state actors, community leaders, teachers and children themselves. Working together to develop shared implementation plan is, plans is crucial to the success of the declaration. And as Save the Children, we work with children, teachers and community members to protect schools and children from attacks. In some countries, as we've heard uh, earlier today, children are organizing themselves at school level in committees and working with teachers and parents to create a safe learning environment in the midst of conflict. And we also know that schools can become a safer place for children if there is commitment to change behavior. And that is why training and dialogue are crucial to the implementation of the guidelines and why Save the Children supports training of armed forces on the Safe School Declaration and the guidelines for protecting schools and university for military use during armed conflict. I also want to, to uh, say a few words on uh, accountability as, as we heard Jasmine uh, do just before me. And I do want to stress the importance of monitoring and reporting of attacks on education. Because documenting and reporting attacks on education provides crucial evidence that allow us to understand the scale of the challenge, but also holding perpetrators to account. It underlines the need for a universal endorsement of the declaration by all states. Because we do know that the Safe School Declaration has and continues to deliver change for children. And it also provides civil society with a common framework to work with children, schools, local communities and decision makers, as well as uh, an opportunity to engage with armed groups and military actors. It is a very powerful tool to protect education from attacks. And in just six years, we have come a long way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we want to hear your questions from you all in the audience. And so I'll kindly invite members of our audience to come forward to this microphone here. Um, and we'd ask that you introduce yourself and then pose a very brief, brief uh, question or perspective. And we'll take a couple of those together. Unfortunately, we have time for, for fewer than we would like, um, but we'll take them together and then we'll give the opportunity for our panelists to respond. 
Now, as we're waiting for the members of our live audience to join us, I want to actually pose a very tricky question from our online audience. And that is a question that notes that there has, in fact, been demonstrable promise, uh, progress since the launch of the Safe Schools Declaration in 2015. And to give one example of the states that endorsed early in the first two years, we actually saw a reduction by almost half of incidents of military use of schools. So, an actually very powerful um, correlation. But at the same time, according to the Global Coalition, by our data, globally, attacks actually increased uh, from 2019 to 2020. So in that one year period, even as schools were closed, and perhaps particularly because schools were closed during the pandemic, we saw an increase um, in attacks. Um, how, what kinds of reflections might our panelists have on, on why that is happening and what else needs to be done? Ambassador, may I turn to you first for this very tricky question? Well, thank you very much. I think we need to start with what fellow panelists have emphasized. The first is accountability. I believe we have not zeroed in much with us accountability, particularly with the international justice system. It will be essential the perpetrators known publicly for committing atrocities against children must be brought to book. And in that context, transitional justice systems, as we review conflict management and resolution processes, must also have special needs for children. Secondly, domestication. The theme of this conference has been from commitment to practice. How do we not just count the numbers of countries that have actually signed up to the declaration or endorsed the declaration, or rather the practical response to protecting children, particularly psychosocial trauma that they experience? Three, in my view, is to promote that international collaboration that will be universal in nature and that will be very deep in essence. How do we move all our member states in intergovernmental processes from this commitment to practice? How do we hold perpetrators accountable to this, for the six grave violations? I think with this, we can really defeat, improve on the record that data is showing us, and ensure that we stop this war against children. Thank you so much. And now I see that we have a question at our, at our microphone, and so we'll give the floor to you, sir. Please first introduce yourself to us, and then um, honor us with your question. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Abubakar Conte, and I'm directing my question to Ambassador. Um, of course, throughout my work in Northeast Nigeria, we have seen two major causes of the problem that is affecting children. One is adults lack the knowledge and support for the well-being of children and the non-existence or dysfunctional structures, systems and laws, law enforcement measures to protect and promote the welfare of children. Now, my question is this. What is the role of the African Union in ensuring that um, states' governments are held accountable in terms of um, domesticating and um, providing budget allocation to support legislative actions that they have signed, both at the AU and at the United Nations uh, Assembly, most especially with regards to conventions that they have signed so far? Thank you. Thank you. As we thank you so much for that um, question, and we, I think I will give the ambassador if you can respond, and we'll um, keep the responses uh, briefer than we would like. No, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, actually, the most important factor is to double up and scale up our efforts in advocacy at the continental level, 
at the regional level. We are right in the premises of ECOWAS. This is where we need all our key players. The ECOWAS parliament, national assemblies across the continent, across the region, state sub-national actors, stakeholders, the academia, the media, the youth, women groups, all must have a stake in this domestication that we mentioned. We cannot fold our arms. And one of the things we're doing in the African Union is to develop what we call a child protection architecture. And I believe I'll be the first commissioner for political affairs, peace, and security ever that will have a child protection expert working right in my office. This is an agenda that is close to my heart, not only personally, but because we have seen the trauma of children. We used to see the trauma of children from the perspective of the humanitarian disasters. But now we are seeing it as part of conflicts. Conflicts exacerbated by non-state armed groups across the continent, in the Lake Chad Basin, in the Sahel, now in Mozambique, in Central African Republic, in Libya, in, uh, in the Horn, and these areas are African. And that is why we have to double our efforts and provide a multi-dimensional, multi-stakeholder approach that is inclusive. Schools must remain inclusive, they must remain safe and secure. That is why we can protect the future, because the future mm -hmm. of any nation is education. Yeah. And if children, as you said, with bullets flying over their heads, education cannot be equal, cannot be qualitative, and of course, cannot be accessible. Thank you so much. We'll take another question from the floor. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Priscilla Ibewe. So my question is really about the practical plans that we have, every country has, including Nigeria, around domesticating the Safe Schools Initiative or declaration. So for example, Africa has a young population and a minister, honorable minister has told us the number of secondary schools and primary schools. So with the minimum standards that we now have, how are we, what is the uh, trajectory in the next five years or next 10 years, if we say by 2030, that 10% will be done by 2022 so that we can get to 2025, I mean in five years time or, th uh, or by 2030, we need clear guidelines to that effect that we can measure ourselves and having a baseline of all schools. Secondly, um, is there a scorecard that is going to be used for countries to test out each other and see how they are doing? Because from declaration to practice, from what we've learned so far, it is really slow. And we need to work faster to safeguard the health, the welfare of our children. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we want to um, turn to one um, final question, one final comment from Ms. Ashing, who has so much contact, you have so much contact and interaction with children. Do you have a message based on your experience um, to the states that are gathered here in the audience for the next three days? Thank you so much. I think this is one of the most important uh, questions. And, and I think uh, we, we got a very clear message from Joy, Paula, Ahmad, and, and Daisy earlier. Uh, and, but I do, I, I just want to, to reinforce how critical it is to listen to the experiences and recommendations uh, coming from children. And in the lead up to this conference, the children consulted more than 300 children across the globe in Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Guatemala, Ukraine, Colombia, Mexico, OPT and Yemen to seek their views. And they shared insightful views and recommendations with us outlined in the Children's Manifesto to, dec to decision makers. And, and I, I really urge all of you to have a close look at that manifesto because there you have some powerful messages coming directly from children. And it is a powerful call to action. Children are calling on us to make these changes needed to protect education from attack. 
and they are telling us that we need to prioritize. They tell us that we need to make sure that they can get to and from school safely. And they're asking us to stop people from entering in schools and harming students. And critically, they want to be able to express their views on how to make schools safer. I also think it's, it's um, having read the manifesto that it's, it paints a stark picture of, of children's experiences and emphasizes the fear uh, th that influences all parts of their, di their lives daily when they are exposed to weapons, armed groups, explosions and gunfire in school or on their way to and from school. And we heard it in, in the opening video, some of the very strong witness and testimonies coming from children. And they don't want to be scared anymore. And it is our responsibility to stop that. They don't, they want to learn in safety. And it is our responsibility to respond and take action by endorsing and implementing the declaration. And just, just to share, two weeks ago, I was in Dori in Burkina Faso. And we had two of the, the young people in the video uh, reporting from Dori, Alima 12 and Sean 10. And I, I visited, I met children and I visited schools and many of the children had been out of school for over a year. And we really, really um, came from a very difficult situation where they had been forced to flee their homes due to conflict. I also visited schools where we ha that had welcomed hundreds of internally displaced students due to the conflict in the country. And they all told me the same message. Children want an end to conflict and they want to be able to safely return to school. They want a proper education. They want to be able to create a future for themselves. And many of them really hope to be able to contribute in rebuilding their societies. Thank you so much for those remarks. And I think that brings us to the end of this um, panel. I just want to emphasize two important points that were made. The first is that this is the plea of children um, to states. This is what children are asking us to do. And second, we have heard from our panelists um, that there are specific concrete things that can and are be done, uh, can, can and are being done. I'll specifically refer to you to a new report from the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack that actually details good practices in 57 countries. So in 2015, when the declaration was first launched, we might not have known how it would be implemented, but today I think we can firmly say that countries are beginning to step forward and do what is necessary to keep schools safe. So with that, I will thank you, Ambassador, and our other esteemed members of the panel, and we'll move to a few closing remarks. Thank you very much. As we close this panel, I want to again thank Joy, Daisy, Ahmed, and Paula. You made it clear to us that governments and the organizations that support them still have so much to do to keep your schools, teachers, and fellow students safe. But your words often also give us hope and they remind us of the critical importance of education. As Ms. Butler eloquently said, schools not only educate, they also protect children. And we know that the Safe Schools Declaration is making a difference, even if it hasn't yet been felt by all. The ambassador, Ms. Ashing, and Ms. Sharif have shown how the declaration really is working. And we heard from Mr. Amani how it's working right here in Nigeria. I want to conclude though by th thanking my fellow members of civil society, the members of our global community, both here in Abuja and online. Today in the midst of a global pandemic that has disrupted the education of more than a billion students, where tax globally have actually increased as schools have st stood vacant and vulnerable, your work protecting education is more important than ever. The 112 governments who have endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration show that change is possible. Now in the weeks that follow this conference, we must be vigilant and we must insist. First, that countries who have not yet endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration do so and join the community of states that is protecting schools. Second, militaries and armed groups must stop attacking schools and universities and specifically prohibit their use for military purposes. Finally, as we heard, accountability, both domestically and international, is essential to deterring future attacks and ensuring justice for victims. Over the next two days, government representatives will come together to discuss progress on meeting their commitments, 
on moving from promise to practice. Know that Joy, Daisy, Ahmed, Paola are looking to you to fulfill that promise. May their words for all of us constitute a clear and urgent call to action. Thank you very much.